Hi, I'm Charles with AniCap. This is my recap for the anime Four Nights of the Apocalypse. If you like my recaps, please consider liking the video. The story begins as a boy named Percival gets his giant hulk of a grandfather to help him knock down a rare bird. Percival almost eats himself off of a mountain, but this kid is our protagonist, so he survives. This kid's grandfather can barely fit on his seat, and they still manage to enjoy the bird for lunch. However, we see that the bird has a strange mark on it. The two then have a little sparring match, and Percival shows off some sweet moves. He is determined to beat the giant mountain of muscles, but he doesn't stand a chance. Percival is frustrated, but his grandfather says that he almost got him, and his attitude completely changes. Old Grandpa washes dishes in the lake and thinks about how much Percival has grown. He rushes home to remind Percival about his birthday tomorrow, but Percival is busy watering the plants. Percival will be turning 16, and he's just excited that he will be able to drink beer, but old grandpa says it's still too soon. Grandpa takes Percival to the top of a mountain to show him the world, and he is sure that Percival is ready to journey around the world. He is shocked though when Percival shows no interest in journeying, and he says it's because he has fun every day just being home. Grandpa tries to encourage him by pointing towards an island of sky people. The giant grandpa hopes that it will inspire Percival, but it doesn't. He explains that the world below where they live is filled with thrilling adventure and mystery. There are twisting towers where eccentric magicians dwell, large caves with opening that lead to the netherworld, and labyrinth forests that no one can ever escape if lost. Grandpa hopes that Percival is even just a little excited, but is shocked when Percival just cares about catching some skyfish with his grandpa. That night, old grandpa explains that Percival's father couldn't wait to leave the house at 16 years old, but Percival is quick to point out that his father is not alive anymore. He wonders if Percival is lonely being there, but he is not because he lives with his favorite person, his grandpa. Percival then repeats a saying that his grandpa always says when he is drunk, that says defeat the evil and help the weak. Percival promises to protect his grandfather, but old grandpa says that he isn't so senile that he needs to be protected. While grandpa sleeps, Percival heads outside where he thinks about all the adventures his grandpa talked about. We see that Percival is actually so excited by adventure that he can barely stay still. However, he tempers himself by saying that he is fine there because he has his grandpa. He wakes up after falling asleep outside and is shocked to see someone mysterious approaching. The man came because his bird signal ended there. He tells Percival that he's looking for a man named Varkis and that just so happens to be his grandfather. This man is an old friend from when they were holy knights, so Percival points him in the direction of their house. This man lets Percival check out his ship, but thinks about how cruel Varkis was for raising a child while hiding the truth. Percival is disappointed that he can't get the boat to move, but begins to think that the guy was pretty creepy. He has a bad feeling, so he begins to head home. The man gets Grandpa's attention, but Varkis must instantly defend himself from the guy's insane attack that sends him flying through the house. The man points out that it's been 16 years since Varkis betrayed their master and fled. Varkis quickly engages this man in combat and accuses him of being the betrayer. This guy is insanely powerful though and lands a devastating attack. Percival arrives at the worst possible moment and demands to know what the man just did to his grandpa. This guy is seriously evil as he tells Percival to just stand by and wait his turn. Percival doesn't listen to a single word and instantly tries to attack him. It's no use as the guy can unleash an immense attack with just the slightest movement of his finger and he tells Percival that he has no discipline. Grandpa uses this moment to grab onto the man and he tells Percival to run away. Percival refuses to leave him there, but the man tells him not to worry, since neither of them will be escaping. With the slightest movement, this man puts several devastating holes in Varghese, and uses his cross attack on Percival next. Percival tries his best to fight back, but it's hopeless. This guy's name is Ironside, and Varghese wonders why he came after him only now. Ironside explains that a few days ago, an ominous prophecy was made. The arrival of an existence that will lead their lord, King Arthur, to his doom. They are named the Four Knights of the Apocalypse. Their identities are unknown, but they cannot say for sure that Varkis is not one of those four knights. The man leaves and Varkis apologizes to Percival. Percival is in tears and apologizes back for not being able to protect him. Varkis wants Percival to find someone that is actually worth protecting. He wants him to trust his heart and find someone important whom he can walk through life with. Percival thinks he is being punished for lying since the truth is that he really did want to go on an adventure. Grandpa says that he lied too, since he was actually glad when Percival said he wasn't lonely because they had each other. Varghese collapses, but he is amazed to see that Percival seems to be fine after taking so much damage. 
Varghese then shockingly reveals that the man that just attacked them is Percival's father. Percival was always told that his father passed away when he was young. He thinks that Grandpa is lying now since he can't believe that his father would do something so horrible to them. Grandpa doesn't have time to explain and tells Percival that he will have to find his father again if he wants answers. He tells Percival to begin his journey but Percival doesn't want his grandpa to pass away. Grandpa tells him that they will be together forever from now on and he wishes luck to his precious grandson. Varghese passes away and Percival screams in agony. Percival buries his grandfather and begins learning to live on his own. Sadly, Percival would eventually find a gift his grandfather left him that would help him on his journey and he holds the clothes close to him. Percival gets suited up and says goodbye to his grandpa. Percival's journey starts off a bit slow but he is soon on the move. Sometime later, Percival has spent an entire day climbing down the mountain where they lived but still can't even see below the clouds. He would climb for several more hours and celebrates when he has almost reached Britannia but instantly falls. Luckily, he is saved by a rock bird so he promises to never eat one again. The thing just kicks him off though so Percival promises to eat it again one day. Percival makes a crash landing and sees an animal he has never seen before. Percival explains to the little creature that he climbed down from the mountain called God's Finger and it took him two days. Percival's grandpa told him about things called villages and towns with lots of people so he asked the little creature if he could take him there. The thing doesn't seem to understand but Percival follows it anyway since he is lonely. Just then Percival spots a group practicing some kind of performance. The leader named Cat starts off the show followed by Miss Elva and her little monkey. Their featured act is a guy named Donnie but he isn't interested in performing without a crowd. Just then they are shocked as Percival is clapping vigorously. He is amazed by their performance and begs them to do it again. Donnie tries to bully Percival into paying for the act but Percival has never even heard of the concept of paying for things. Donnie gets him to give all his stuff as payment instead and begins his performance by making Percival float. Of course Percival is amazed but Donnie's actually kind of a jerk as he forces his two friends to run off with him. Donnie says he is just teaching the kid how the world works but Elva doesn't want to leave the poor kid since he seems to be all alone. Donnie thinks they have gotten too far to turn back now but everyone is shocked when Percival instantly catches up to them. Percival isn't upset at all and he simply wonders if they know where he can find Ironside. They wonder if Ironside is a friend of his but Percival is quick to point out that Ironside is his father that ended his grandfather's life. Percival isn't even sure if what he seeks is revenge but he definitely has a lot of questions for Ironside. Percival gets excited to hear about a village and they even offer to take him there. Donnie doesn't want to just take him for free so they decide to see if Percival can give a performance. Percival tries out using a bow and arrow but somehow manages to hit Donnie when he was behind him. Katz decides to take him for free since they travel from village to village putting on shows anyway. Percival was amazed by their magic but Donnie explains that they were pretty much just tricks and he hates having to rely on subpar powers to make money. Katz explains that their team is made up of dropouts whose dream of joining the Holy Knights were crushed. Percival remembers that Ironside mentioned that he and Varghees were Holy Knights before and the others are amazed. They wonder what country Percival is from but he doesn't even have a clue what a country is. Just then some strangers frantically tell them to get help as their village is being attacked by a wolf. Donnie thinks that they can drive the wolf away themselves but instantly changes his mind when they arrive to find the terrifying giant wolf. Donnie says that there is nothing they can do for the village but everyone is shocked when Percival springs into action. Percival remembers his grandpa's words to always defeat the evil and help the weak so that's exactly what he does. He tells the wolf to prepare to become his dinner but all of Percival's arrows completely miss the mark and come right back to him instead. The wolf is about to take him out but Donnie surprisingly comes back to save him. Donnie is in great pain but he blames Percival for getting him all fired up to be a hero. He warns Percival to run away as the wolf is going in to finish him but everyone is stunned when Percival stops it. Percival instantly knocks the giant monster out with one attack leaving everyone in awe. We see that the wolf had a mark like the bird did from earlier and the little pink fox looking thing saw everything. We also see that some knight was amazed by the display and decides that he will be next to act. Afterwards Elva helps Percival get cleaned up and is horrified by his scars that haven't even had enough time to heal yet. She explains that holy knights have magical powers that they use to protect the kingdom and its people and she thinks Percival might have what it takes to become one of them after seeing how he rushed in to save the village. Everyone celebrates their savior at a little party but none of them have even heard of Ironside. Percival gets frustrated but is stunned when a floating man reveals that he knows the name. 
This night came after the elimination of his wolf familiar and after hearing reports that Varghese and his grandson were defeated. This knight is surprised to see that Percival is still alive and determines that his father really did care about him after all. The knight rudely asks about his grandfather, so Katz demands that he apologize. This guy is a holy knight, so he easily knocks Katz away. He is the black knight called Pelagard, and he is a comrade of Ironside and Varghese. Pelagard admires how Percival doesn't fear him, but Percival has no interest in chit-chatting and gives the guy 5 seconds to tell him where Ironside is. The 5 seconds go by with no resolution, so Percival charges at him. Pelagard is stunned to see that Percival is challenging him barehanded and amazed when he manages to push him back in all his heavy armor. The guy agrees to tell Percival whatever he wants if he wins, but if he loses then he will take Percival away. He can see Percival's potential, so he would like to train him himself. Percival is more defiant than ever as he has no plans of going with him and vows to win the fight. Unfortunately, this guy is way stronger than Percival and easily stops him. Pelagard tells Percival that if he isn't going to fight with a weapon, then he better start using his magic, but Percival reveals that he doesn't have any magic. Pelagard wonders if he overestimated the boy and decides to end the fight quickly by punching him in the gut. The beating is relentless as Percival refuses to give up. Donnie tries to jump in to help his new friend, but Elva stops him since it will only make things worse. Some young kid in the crowd idolizes the savior of their town and is certain that his new hero won't lose. Percival is inspired by the boy and somehow manages to push the knight back. Percival doesn't even understand how he did it and everyone is shocked when magic begins flowing from his hands. Percival has no clue what is going on and even begins to freak out because it feels so weird. He desperately tries to get it off and accidentally sends the knight flying back. Donnie explains that it must be Percival's magic and urges him to use it to beat Pelagard. Percival is an honest kid though, so he asks for permission to use his magic in the fight since he told Pelagard that he didn't have any magic earlier. He allows it so they both decide to not hold back. Percival must quickly dodge Pelagard's fireball and Donnie is shocked as his magic is far greater than even their leader's. Percival won't survive if it hits him, so he desperately dodges. Pelagard urges him to start attacking, so Percival starts by knocking the fireball away. Unfortunately, it still hits him and Pelagard explains that his flames burn its target to nothing. Unless he cancels the spell, they will never go out. He demands that Percival surrender, but Percival can't stand losing. Pelagard is stunned when Percival uses his magic to protect his body, but tells him that it's too late since he has taken too much damage. Just then, little minions start appearing everywhere, and Pelagard wonders if Percival is creating them unconsciously. The little guys manage to interrupt Pelagard's spell, and Percival shockingly begins healing. Pelagard realizes that Percival is using the rarest type of magic that doesn't fit in any category. It's not destruction type, incantation type, degeneration type, or even healing type. He isn't sure, but he thinks it might be the one that is said to belong to one of 10,000 people. It's called the hero type magic. Pelagard fears that the others will come after Percival if they find out, so he can't allow it. Percival wants to continue the fight as everyone begins to believe that he can win, and Pelagard explains that he wants to train him more than ever. Pelagard flatters Percival by showering him with praise, but explains that Percival really doesn't have a chance of winning. Donnie realizes this as well, so he levitates Pelagard so Percival can get away. Pelagard has had enough of the games though and blows up the entire area. He prepares to finish Percival off, but the little red fox from earlier steps between them. Pelagard tries to shoo it away, but is stunned when it teleports his prey to safety. Donnie points out that they have been teleported to the top of an insanely large dragon's spine 30 miles away from their village, so Percival wants to rush back. The fox shockingly speaks and tells them that the village will be safe since the knight just wanted them. He explains that Pelagard serves an evil king and is part of the group who targets the four knights of the apocalypse. The four knights don't actually exist yet, but they will appear in the not so distant future. The fox has orders from a group that opposes them and explains that he actually just found one of the four knights. The four knights are famine, pestilence, war, and death. The four holy knights who will destroy the world with four calamities. The fox then stuns both of them when he reveals that Percival is one of these four knights of the apocalypse. Elsewhere, Pelagar joins a meeting of holy knights where they are told that they have identified the four knights of the apocalypse as young boys. One is a boy with golden magical power. One is a boy with holiness and evil in his eyes. One is a big mysterious boy with no fixed appearance. And the other one is a boy with green feather-like hair. Ironside is in disbelief when he hears this, and their leader explains that they have to find the four knights for their king. No matter what, they need to get to them first and dispose of them quickly. Pelagard reveals to Ironside that Percival is still alive, so Ironside questions if he ended his life. 
Pelagard thinks that that would be a waste and would rather make Percival their ally and train him well. Ironside attacks him, but Pelagard refuses to fight. Ironside points out that Pelagard doesn't understand what is happening. Percival is not just a threat to their king, he is going to end up destroying the entire world. The Pink Fox tells Percival the exact same thing, but Percival simply says he just won't destroy the world. He explains that after he beats up his father, he will just go on an adventure to explore the mysterious place that his grandfather told him about. He won't become a holy knight and he won't destroy the world. The fox reveals that Percival's father and his comrades are all in a place called Camelot. It's a kingdom that got destroyed in the holy war against the demon clan 16 years ago. All it took was one hit from the demon king and everything was destroyed without a trace. Donnie explains that Camelot doesn't exist anymore, so Percival tells the little fox to beat it since he won't be going with him. The fox assures him that it really does exist, but explains that the journey there is very difficult. Percival instantly changes his mind because it sounds like an adventure, and the fox introduces himself as Sin. The three of them begin the journey, but they soon get hungry, so Percival decides that they should have a contest to see who can find the best prey. Donnie takes Percival's bow and arrow, but that's okay because Percival finds an interesting place for himself to hunt. Donnie is pretty bad at aiming the bow and finds that he struck a giant nun with the arrow. Donnie apologizes, but the nun says it's okay since she only screamed because she was startled. Just then, some fairy looking guys urgently tell the giant that a human with a strange helmet entered the Echo Gorge. Donnie realizes that they are talking about Percival, and the fairies explain that the gorge was once a beautiful place. However, it is now a living nightmare. We then see exactly what they were talking about as Percival is faced with several monsters, but he makes quick work of them. He is actually really happy since all the prey are just coming to him, so he is sure to win the competition. Just then, he hears something calling for help. In a nearby house, we see that some little clown monster is tied up and being interrogated. Some kid decides that the little creature will be his guinea pig for some experiments, and the little guy cries for help. Percival comes to the rescue, but just ends up getting a face full of wood. The little monster impatiently tells Percival to free him, and it instantly flies away. Percival is amazed by the fairy-like monster that he has never seen before, but he loses consciousness. Donnie and his new friends are on their way to find Percival, and the giant explains that some guy used a weird medicine to make all the living creatures in the gorge violent. This guy is really upset with Percival, and plans to have him take the monster's place as his guinea pig. This kid is known as the mad herbalist named Nasons. Percival's friends reach the entrance to the gorge, but the fairies fear that they may be too late. They once witnessed the evil herbalist in action, so Donnie says they need to hurry. Percival wakes up, which is very odd to Nasons, since he should have been out cold for at least 10 hours. Percival demands that he get his clothes back, since his father gave them to him, so the boy shows him where they are. Everything but his helmet and cloak were practically destroyed already. However, the helmet and cloak are magic items with strong magical powers. Nasons wastes no time and injects Percival with his mixture. It should take an hour to start working, but Nasons is fascinated when it works instantly. Percival is sure that this guy is evil as he was going to hurt that fairy, but Nasons explains that that fairy broke into his house and attacked him first. Percival is convinced that Nasons had blood coming out of his mouth because he bit the fairy, but that isn't the case. Nasons gets excited because Percival is the perfect guinea pig, so Nasons starts bleeding from the mouth again. Biting his lip when he gets excited is just something Nasons has done since childhood. Percival thinks that he should kick the habit, and Nasons says that his sister says the exact same thing. Back with Donnie's group, they are being chased by violent monsters. Donnie calls Nasons evil for causing this issue, but the giant gets upset and says that Nasons isn't like that. Nasons plans to let Percival go after he tries one last medicine, but if he makes the wrong mixture, then Percival will lose his life. Nasons is shaking and explains that he has a mission he needs to fulfill. Percival has a mission as well, so he breaks free, but Nasons isn't prepared to let him go. Nasons promises not to take his life, but the two begin fighting. Percival offers to help him if he needs it, but Nasons just wants test subjects for his medicine. The only reason he doesn't test on himself is because if he ends himself, then he won't be able to save the gorge. Percival's helmet flies off when his hair expands, which allows him to get the medicine, and he refuses to give it back. He then shocks the evil scientist when he chugs it on his own. Percival writhes in pain, so Nason tries to get him to spit it back up. Percival always keeps us guessing though, as he says that he can feel the power surging through his body, and he now has endless amounts of energy. He rushes outside to say something silly, and his friends determine that he must be okay. Nasons can't believe what he just did, and Percival says that it was an easy decision to drink the medicine, since Nason was just trying to save the gorge. It's clear that the medicine works, so Nason shockingly chugs it down next. Donnie arrives just then, and wonders what Percival did to the kid. 
The fairies don't believe that Nathan's are trying to save the gorge, but he whispers the name Ordo. Ordo was an old apothecary that once lived there. He was kind to everyone in the gorge and took care of them when they got injured. They found the young giant whose name is Dolores and the young human Nasons. Ordo taught Nasons everything he knows, but one day he just went missing. Since that day, Nasons started doing weird experiments. Nearby, the little orange monster plans to destroy the entire forest and he shockingly asks Ordo if he agrees. Nasons wakes up and urgently wants to go spread his medicine throughout the gorge. Some fairies appear to attack him and they blame Nasons for Ordo leaving. They accuse him of trying to destroy the gorge and tell him to leave. Percival stands up for him and tells the little jerks that Nasons is actually trying to save the gorge. Just then, the forest begins to decay and the animals begin to pass away. Nasons realizes that he is out of time, so he must use the medicine. Percival points out that there is none left, but Nasons shockingly creates some from his body. Nasons reveals that after he ingests a poison, he teaches it to his body, and then he can freely create and mix his own. His magic is called Mixed Venom, and he tells everyone to cover their mouths. Nasons creates a mist from his medicine that gets carried by the wind, and the gorge amazingly begins to revive. Nasons refers to Ordo as his grandfather, and recalls the lessons he was taught. Afterwards, Percival gets a fresh cut, and Dolores makes him some clothes. The fairies apologize to Nasons, but he completely understands since the monsters going crazy was a side effect of his medicine. No one knows why the gorge was the king in the first place, but once Ordo disappeared, something started eating into the life force of everything. Nasons tells the fairies that Percival is the one that should be thanked, so they praise him, and the kid soaks it all in. Just then, a hideous monster appears, and Nasons can tell that it's Ordo. It's clearly a hideous creature, but Percival is just jealous that Nasons grandpa is three times bigger than his was. Nasons wants to know what happened, but Dolores stops him from getting too close. Ordo releases a fog that causes the forest to begin rotting, so Nasons begs him to stop. Nasons tries to remind Ordo that he loved the gorge, but he's a monster now and he wants to destroy it. Ordo plans to crush Nasons and Percival can't stop it, but Dolores arrives just in time. She tries to remind Ordo that they are a family, but the monster hits her with its poison, causing major damage. Just then, the fairy from earlier arrives and they all realize that it was the one that transformed Ordo. It did it because he says Ordo is a sinner and he must atone for his sins by destroying the gorge. Ordo prepares to consume Nasons, but Percival manages to stop it. Nasons is beginning to lose hope, but Percival grabs a hold of him and tells him that they will get his grandpa back together. The evil fairy commands Ordo to run wild, but instantly gets an arrow through its head and it melts away. No one knows where the arrow came from, but Ordo collapses and a holy knight appears before them. It is the Amber Knight and his name is Talisker. Talisker tells them that if they can land a single blow on him, then he will tell them the sin that Ordo committed. If they somehow manage to beat him though, then he will turn Ordo back. Sin warns Nason not to fall for Talikar's taunting, but it's too late. Nason uses his ability to apply poison to his daggers, and Percival decides to fight too. Percival confidently tries to activate his magic, but only manages to let out a little bit of gas instead. Nason tries to attack on his own, but their opponent is a holy knight, and uses an insane attack that creates a hailstorm. Percival managed to rescue him, but Talisker has Ordo join the fight. He tries to have Ordo finish Nasons off, but Percival once again intervenes. Percival urges Ordo to remember his family and explains that Nasons worked so hard to protect the gorge for him. Talisker commands Ordo to end their lives, but Ordo has stopped listening as he seems to be coming back to his senses. Talisker decides to just send them all to the afterlife with his next attack. Sin is strangely okay with things ending this way, but Percival is a hero. He takes to the sky and sacrifices his body to destroy all the hail. Percival is severely injured and Talisker wonders if the kid lost his mind. Percival tells Nasons that they will get his grandpa back no matter what, so Nasons hope is restored. Talisker has had enough of the games. He prepares his next attack but stops when an immense power surges from Percival's body. Talisker has never seen such unstructured magic and Percival is shockingly healed from all the damage. Donnie realizes that it's much more magic than last time and no one can understand what is happening. Talisker uses another powerful attack, but Percival's magic just consumes it and spits it back at Talisker. Talisker is becoming really annoyed, but Percival tells him that he's going to defeat him so Ordo can go back to normal. Talisker attacks with his weapon, but it's no use, and now it's Percival's turn. Talisker isn't afraid since Percival is unarmed, but Percival forms a hand with his magic and gives Talisker a good smack. Landing a hit means Talisker must explain why he transformed Ordo. Ordo was helping everyone in the forest, but Talisker explains that rescuing races that aren't human is a sin. 
Talisker's Lord Arthur wants humanity to live in peace with no other race to threaten it. Talisker warned Ordo to stop, but he didn't, so Talisker punished him. He turned him into a monster driven by an impulse to destroy and a duty to menace the world. Talisker wanted him to destroy the gorge, so Ordo used his poison to drive all the animals out. That's enough explaining for Talisker, so he uses his magic that controls the weather. His lightning strike hits Percival, but this just gets him mad. Percival charges at him with his now lightning charged magic and points out that he lost his own grandfather without any reason as well. Talisker is shocked that Percival took his lightning magic and just now realizes that this kid is the green haired knight of the apocalypse. Talisker dodges the attack and realizes his good fortune. If he can eliminate Percival, then the doomsday prophecy for King Arthur will be gone for good. Sin reveals to Percival that his magic forms whatever is on his mind, so he should picture a weapon that will knock out Talisker in one shot. Talisker uses his most powerful attack, but it resembles a bird that Percival is very familiar with. Percival forms a knife like the one he used to cut up the bird, and he uses it to cut up the attack. Talisker is absolutely stunned and can't believe how powerful one of the four knights of the apocalypse is. Percival turns his magic into a projectile and the fight is finally over. No one can believe what they just saw and they realize that Percival blew away the holy knight along with the mountain. The fight is over but Percival doesn't even know how to put his magic away. Donnie thinks that they are being attacked by a giant zombie but it's just Dolores. They can't understand how she is still alive but Sin explains that giants have an ability that turns their bodies into metal for self-defense. She must have used it right before being attacked with a reaction time that makes it clear that she has extensive battle training. Things aren't great though as Nasons has a memory of when Ordo promised to save every race. Nasons breaks down as he points out that he tried so hard to protect the gorge because Ordo loved it so much. Percival apologizes because he couldn't keep his promise to transform Ordo back to normal but Sin finds something that Talisker dropped. Sin destroys it and Ordo magically turns back to normal. Nysen sobs uncontrollably and the two are finally reunited. Afterwards, Donnie makes fun of Nysen for crying like a little girl. He quickly realizes that he is being rude though when Percival says that it's a natural reaction since Nysen got to see his grandpa again. Sin explains that the thing he broke was a chaos staff. These staffs are infused with chaotic force and the king of Camelot hands them out to his knights. Just then, Percival proclaims that he has made a decision. He initially thought that all he wanted was to beat up his father, but everything just changed. Percival now wants to defeat the King of Camelot too. He never wants anyone to go through what he went through, and Sin likes to see this resolve. Percival remembers that they were having a competition, but neither of them have brought their prey. The little fox reveals that he managed to capture some evil looking rabbit, and reminds the both of them that the winner gets to give one order to the losers. Sin seems to have bad intentions, but Percival assumes he wants them to pick fleas off of him. Just then, Nason appears and shockingly would like to go with them. Nason owes Percival for saving them and Ordo told Nason to go out and learn the world. Sin thinks that his magic and knowledge of poisons could be useful to them. Donnie doesn't think it's a good idea, but Sin reminds him that he has to obey his one order. Dolores is pretty sad that Nason is leaving, but Ordo points out that Nason finally has a person he can call a friend. Our group begins their journey and starts by heading to a town called Sistana to find transportation. Ahead of them in Sistana, we see that a party is taking place and Ironside is there. He is searching for something in the city, but Duke Calden tells him that nothing has come up. His daughter has some kind of ability that lets her know that her father is lying, but she is more concerned with Ironside. Ironside says that he wants to save the town, but the girl can tell that he does not even breathe a single word of truth. Her name is Anne and Ironside would like for her to meet his son. She was spaced out so Ironside just says to continue looking for the piece of the coffin of eternal darkness. Elsewhere, Percival tries to command his little minions, but they don't listen. Nasons, however discovers that if he poisons one of the mini Percivals, it changes color. Percival then shows the Moroboros the carving knife his grandpa gave him. Seeing as how it can grow, it's clearly a magic sword, but Percival still thinks it's a knife. Percival explains that he doesn't know anything about his grandpa's life as a holy knight, which is just more of a reason to find Ironside in Camelot. Nasons has his doubts about the existence of Camelot, but Percival says that he trusts Sin, and he wouldn't lie. The guys want Sin to use the teleporting orb to take them to the kingdom of Lioness so they don't have to walk, but that was his last one. Nasons is familiar with the spell bead and explains that one of the legendary knights of the seven deadly sins named Merlin created them. They are orbs with different magic effects. Nason's mouth gushes with blood as he gets excited while explaining that Merlin wrote a book about poisons. 
They eventually reach Sistana and Percival's little minions strangely rush off. They get Percival to dig something up and Sin is shocked when he realizes what it is, before he can say anything and tells them to put it back in the ground. However, if they plan to give it to a certain knight, then she will have to eliminate them instead. Donnie tries to explain that it was discovered by accident, but she doesn't believe them. Anne attacks them and doesn't listen to a single word they say. She plans to take the item back by force, but Percival just hands it to her. Percival says that it really was an accident and the girl uses her ability on them. She can see that they are all hiding something, but she is shocked when she sees that there is nothing false or hidden about Percival. Sin wants to know more about the knight she mentioned, but a maid comes to get her. Anne panics and hides the item inside Percival's cloak. She tells him not to show anyone, but shocks everyone when she tells him to make sure to never let a knight named Ironside see it. Afterwards, Sin explains that the thing is a magic item of legend that was crafted by a giant. It's his first time seeing one, and it's a piece of the coffin of eternal darkness. Percival hasn't listened to a single word and just wants to go find Ironside since the girl mentioned him being there. Sin calms him down though by pointing out that a fight there could harm villagers. There are still a lot of questions that need to be answered, and they need to make sure that the magic item is even real. Elsewhere, Anne tries to explain to her father that Ironside cannot be trusted. Her father knows about her ability, but he doesn't like her using it because it's dangerous. Calden explains that Ironside fought alongside her mother to protect people, so they should just trust and obey him. He also fears what Ironside would do if they disobeyed him, so his decision is to avoid putting the townspeople in danger. Anne proclaims that she will become a holy knight and protect the people herself. She tells her father to stop being Ironside's lapdog, but he just slaps her. Calden goes to meet with Ironside, and we see that our heroes are watching them. Percival can't contain his anger and must be held back from attacking. Ironside addresses the crowd and gets them all terrified by saying that something is threatening their town. He reveals an artifact and our boys can tell that it's only missing their piece. Sin explains that if he completes the artifact, it will be over for them all. The item was created to steal away the demon clan and the goddess clan sacrificed themselves to trigger it. There are no goddesses around now, so Ironside must be planning to sacrifice the townspeople to activate it. Percival is ready to beat him up now, but Sin calms him down again. They have the missing piece of artifact, so they need to leave the town with the fragment. Percival doesn't want to leave when he has worked so hard to find Ironside, but Sin points out that he is no match for him right now. Ironside tells the crowd that if he can complete the artifact, then he will hold a ritual that will protect Sistana from disaster. He says that the Kingdom of Lioness is gathering dreadful demons to wipe Britannia off the map, so everyone gets really mad at the kingdom. However, Anne arrives and shocks everyone when she accuses Ironside of lying. Ironside says that she is just young and speaking nonsense, but Anne reveals her ability to everyone. Ironside plans to discipline her for lying, and Sin wants to get away while they are arguing. The others agree but are stunned when Percival jumps in to tell Ironside to stop. Ironside can tell that Percival wants to avenge Varkis, but then wonders if the boy might be trying to take the coffin. Percival uses his minions to distract Ironside and runs off with Anne. Ironside does major damage while trying to stop them and explains that he doesn't care if he would have hurt Anne since he would just consider her a worthy sacrifice. Donnie wonders if they should go back to help Percival, but Sin explains that they need to secure the magic item first. Unfortunately, they find that Anne's maid has the item. She is actually Ironside's familiar and flies away. Percival arrives and it becomes clear that Ironside must have been watching Anne all along. Ironside no longer needs Calden as he completes the artifact. Sin explains that the artifact needs a blood sacrifice. They have to destroy the coffin or take one of the pieces to stop it. Ironside is preparing to do the ritual right now, so they all decide to work together to stop him. Sin says that he will go prepare for anything that might happen, but Anne can sense that he is hiding something. Sin tells Percival to not even dare to try seriously fighting Ironside. No matter how strong Percival thinks he is, Ironside is 10 times stronger than that. Their mission starts and Anne thanks Percival for helping her earlier. Percival explains that Ironside ended his grandfather's life and Anne says that Ironside wanted to marry her off to his son. Anne assumes that his son is just as bad as he is and the guys laugh knowing that Percival is his son. Back at the house, Ironside begins chanting and the coffin begins to glow. The ritual begins to intensify and a black substance erupts from the ground. The black substance makes its way into town where we see that one of them transforms the first thing it touches into a monster. More black substances fall so a statue and an entire house become hideous monsters. 
Ironside tells his familiar named Darak that he will command the chaotic dead and his goal is to make all of the townspeople sacrifices. Our group is horrified to see that there are so many monsters collecting sacrifices, but Percival is certain that Sin will figure something out. They just need to worry about stopping Ironside, but Anne reveals that Sin is lying to him about something. She can tell because of her ability, but Percival still trusts Sin. The others trust the little fox as well, but Anne thinks they are just being gullible. Anne finds her unconscious father, and Ironside wonders what Percival wants. He says that normally he would just destroy Percival, but tonight he is busy. Percival demands that Ironside stop the ritual, but Ironside terrifies them when he shows them just a bit of his power. They know that they must try to attack, but their bodies won't move. What's most terrifying is they can tell that Ironside wouldn't hesitate for a moment to end their lives. Percival isn't scared though and jumps forward to use his Hand of God magic slap. Ironside stops the attack while barely even moving, and Donnie is stunned since that was the attack that destroyed Talisker. Ironside thinks it would be foolish for Percival to try to fight him, and Nason reminds Percival what they are there to do. Percival sends his little Percivals after the coffin, but it's no use. Ironside wants to know what they are trying to do, but Percival refuses to tell his deadbeat father. Ironside gets upset, and everyone must dodge as he uses an immense attack. Ironside once again tells Percival that he lacks discipline and demands that he respect him as his father. Anne is shocked when the guys catch her up on Percival's family troubles and Donnie thinks they need to run away. He says they don't really have anything to do with the town and Anne surprisingly agrees. This is the town's problem so she thinks that she should be facing Ironside by herself. Nasons knows far too well what it's like to want to defend a homeland and he decides to stay. Donnie doesn't even hesitate though and runs away as he doesn't want to die. Percival does the opposite by running straight into danger and he warns Ironside that he will destroy the coffin if he doesn't stop. Ironside shows off his insane finger power again but Percival dodges. He tells the others that he will pin Ironside down so they can destroy the coffin. The terrifying knight easily stops Percival but he is quite impressed. Ironside prepares to end his son's life but Anne stops him. Ironside laughs at the girl for thinking she could do anything to him, but she tries her best and states that she will become a holy knight like her mother. Ironside seems to simply be toying with her and he destroys her clothes. This chick is seriously determined though, so she tears off her ruined dress and Percival admires her heroic behavior. Ironside acknowledges her guts, but he is a serious misogynist and says that her bravery is too good for a girl. He is impressed that she was able to at least scratch him, but he is ready to finish her off. Unfortunately for him, he begins to faint and Nasons reveals that he put a paralysis effect on Anne's sword. Ironside is getting really annoyed by all the undisciplined brats and he determines that they are all desperate to get a taste of despair. Ironside prepares a strange attack and everyone panics including Anne's father. Ironside activates the powerful spell and its destruction can be seen from really far away. Donnie runs through the town but there are tons of monsters everywhere. He needs to get out of there quickly, but he hears some little kid calling out for help. Donnie wishes someone would help her already, and he thinks about what his uncle would want him to do. Back on the mountain, Anne can't understand why her father sacrificed himself for her, and he simply explains that it's because she is his daughter. Luckily, she realizes that Percival used his minis to protect him, and the same goes for Nason's. They desperately search for Percival and find that he is in Ironside's hand. Ironside commends Percival for protecting his friends, but he knows that if Percival is allowed to grow up, he will become a fearsome threat. Percival couldn't care less about what this jerk is saying and just wants to know why Ironside ended his grandfather's life. Ironside explains that he had to, even if there was only just a slight chance that Varghese was part of the Four Knights of the Apocalypse. That's not all though as Ironside gets really angry and reveals that Varghese took something dear to him and fled. Anne's attempt at saving Percival fails, but she reminds Percival about the coffin. Ironside stops him from attacking it though. Percival demands that he stop the ritual, but Ironside sends his blade through Percival's hand instead. Ironside has to be one of the worst fathers ever as he moves his sword around inside Percival's hand. Anne tries to guilt Ironside into stopping by reminding him that Percival is his son, but that doesn't work and he strikes fear into her very soul. Ironside is having a good old time being a terrible father and Anne begs him to stop before Percival dies. Ironside explains that once the ritual is done, it will make Linus crumble. And when he takes care of Percival, the Four Knights of the Apocalypse will never form a complete group. Percival's minis try to protect and heal him, but Ironside crushes them. He thinks that it's dumb magic, but it's perfectly suitable for a failure like Percival. 
Nasons begs for Ironside to stop, but it's too late as Ironside plunges his sword into Percival. The many Percivals disappear and Nasons breaks down as he failed to do anything to help. The cold-blooded, soulless Ironside is glad that the Four Knights of the Apocalypse prophecy will no longer come true now that Percival is gone. Ironside just goes right back to finishing the ritual and commands the monsters to massacre the entire town to create sacrifices. Nasons drags Percival closer and Ironside tells them to just go home. Nasons desperately tries to give Percival one of his poisons, but it's no use. Anne takes it from him though and forces it down Percival's throat. Unfortunately, shoving it down his throat doesn't work and Anne points out how horrible it is that Percival's life ended at the hands of his own father. Ironside isn't even paying attention to them anymore and continues demanding for sacrifices from the monsters. Back in town, the girl that was begging for help earlier is no longer scared. It turns out that Donnie lifted the monster in the sky and told the girl that he would fix everything before it falls back down. The girl's mom assumes that Donnie is a holy knight and is certain that he will save the town. We then see that Donnie is rushing back to the mountain and he has determined that there are way too many monsters so he won't be able to escape. He goes back and forth in his mind as he is terrified that Ironside will kill him but he doesn't want to let down his new friends. Donnie realizes that he doesn't need to fight Ironside and he only needs to get the coffin. He gains even more confidence though since Percival is there and everything always turns out okay when he's around. Just then, a baby Percival appears and Ironside is shocked that Percival somehow regained a tiny bit of magic. This should be impossible since he is sure that he ended Percival's life. It's no big deal for this guy though as he can easily do it again with a simple attack. The explosion is massive but Nasons protects Percival's body. Ironside realizes that the paralyzing potion has drastically affected his magic's precision, so he tells Nasons to get out of his way. Nasons refuses and continues to protect Percival from Ironside's attacks. Nasons explains that he still hasn't repaid his debt to Percival, so things can't end this way, and another mini surprisingly appears. Anne attacks Ironside and says that Percival can't die yet since she has never met someone with no lies or trickery like him. His friend's hopefulness seems to be doing something as more mini Percivals begin to appear. Nasons continues by admiring how Percival rescued everyone in the forest and he calls him his hero. This really seems to do the trick as more minis appear and Percival begins to glow. Ironside cuts off some of Anne's hair but warns her that her head will be next. Just then, Ironside is stunned as he sees that Percival's magic is multiplying on its own. That's not the only surprise though as Donnie arrives and recites Percival's saying, crush the evil and rescue the weak. Nasons wonders why he came back and Donnie says it's simply because they have Percival there. He wonders where his little buddy is but everyone is shocked when the mini Percivals multiply everywhere. Everyone gets covered in them but no one knows what's happening. Ironside decides to just attack everything and Anne's father is shocked when everyone is gone. Ironside really begins to see just how dangerous Percival can be and determines that he must finish him for good. We then see what he is upset about as Percival has brought everyone to the sky. Percival tells all his friends that he heard them calling to him through the darkness. This is his magic but he credits them for giving him the strength to use it. They all believed in him and those feelings gave him power. Percival remembers how his grandpa wanted him to find someone whose heart he could trust and he tells him that he found them. Ironside is in complete disbelief and wonders what kind of power this is. Percival has another memory of his grandpa and calls his magic the same thing his grandpa once called him, hope. Ironside is stunned to hear that Percival is able to convert people's feelings of hope into his own power. He has clearly underestimated his unwanted son but explains that even if Percival has managed to buy a little time, nothing will change. The town will soon meet its demise and the ritual will begin. In town, people are being terrorized and all the monsters are determined to activate the coffin of eternal darkness at all costs. One poor guy is about to become monster food but a mysterious man rescues him. This guy starts doing some serious damage with his unique attack and Darak takes notice. Ironside has finished preparing for the ritual but Darak must explain to him that the dead are being destroyed one after another by a mysterious attacker. There is no information on this guy, so Darak goes to confront him but it doesn't go well for Ironside's goon. Our heroes wonder if it's some group of holy knights that have come to help, and Donnie assumes that Sin succeeded in getting back up. Percival declares their victory, and Ironside has no choice but to concede. This terrible father tells his fatherless offspring that he is sure that Varghese would be proud of him. The orphan boy is quick to point out that Ironside took his grandfather's life, so Ironside explains that he was ordered to do it. 
Ironside almost seems to express remorse for what he had done, and even points out that he attempted to eliminate his own son twice. Even though it's like only the second time they have met, Ironside reveals that this will be the last time they will ever see each other. He will be punished for failing his mission, so he will be executed. Ironside tells Percival to come to him so he can see his beloved son's face one last time before he dies, but Anne uses her ability to see that Ironside is lying. Apparently, no one could have guessed that this evil father killer was lying, so Anne warns Percival that Ironside just wants to kill him. Ironside becomes increasingly annoyed by Anne and just comes out and tells Percival that he wants to end him. Ironside uses his terrifying cross attack, but Percival manages to dodge them all. His friends are amazed by his speed, but Percival credits their feelings for giving him this power. Ironside can't seem to land a single attack, and he realizes it's because his body is still a bit numb. Percival then used the cheesy power of friendship and drops little Percival bombs to create a smokescreen. Percival tries to land a punch, but Ironside can easily read his movements. Things are seriously dangerous, so Percival remembers how Sin warned him not to try to fight Ironside for any reason. The others point out that their movement is limited as long as Ironside is by the coffin, so they need to figure out how to get him away from it. Percival comes up with an idea and calls on his trusty friend Donnie. Percival prepares for another attack, but Ironside reminds him that he has no chance of defeating him. Percival is well aware that he can't beat him in a fight, but his goal is something else. Ironside is then shocked as Percival attacks the coffin with his blade. The coffin breaks apart and Donnie keeps a piece from falling, since all they need to do is keep one piece away from Ironside to stop the ritual. Ironside's helmet falls apart and we get our first look at Percival's deadbeat father. This evil looking dude explains to Percival that he hasn't won yet. All Ironside will have to do is end his life along with all his friends' lives and reassemble the coffin. Even if this town won't provide the sacrifices he needs, Britannia is crawling with more. Ironside prepares to end all their lives, but some guy dressed like a golden trophy arrives to stop him. Sir Glimmers a lot is actually named Mortlock, and Ironside demands that he let him go. Mortlock is a pretty laid-back guy though, and understands how frustrated Ironside must be. His ritual has gotten all messed up, and he is duty-bound not to let one of the four knights of the apocalypse escape. Mortlock reveals that their real problem is this mystery person that appeared in town. Ironside summoned high-level dead monsters, but this mysterious guy instantly wiped them all out. Mortlock fears that if such a beast really exists, then they must surely be one of the legendary heroes, the Seven Deadly Sins. Either that or someone with just as much fighting power. Everyone is shocked to hear these words, and Ironside agrees that it would be best for them to leave. Our heroes are glad that it's all over, but they can hardly move. Percival can't believe he almost died, but the others point out that he actually did die for a second there. Donnie thinks they did a good job against Ironside, but Anne rejects the idea. If Percival didn't come back, then they would all be dead. Percival, always looking at the bright side, explains that they won because they all worked together. Anne goes to greet her father and acknowledges how horrible it must have been for him having to obey Ironside's orders. Sin arrives soon after, and everyone wonders who Sin sent to help them save the town. They all hope that it was one of the seven deadly sins, but Sin reveals that it was his forest pals. Anne can tell that he is lying, but Percival believes him completely. Percival is bursting with energy and notices that his cloak that made him look like a bird earlier returned to normal. Nasons points out that it must have been his magic that transformed it, but Percival has some serious ADD and can't focus on anything. Everyone is glad to see that the kid is okay even after having to fight his own father, and Percival runs off to take care of very important business. Sometime later, when Percival is all alone, he begins to cry as he thinks about how his father looks so much like his grandpa. Elsewhere, Ironside is scolded for his failure. King Arthur is disappointed but wants Ironside to send a message to those that defeated him. If they want to destroy the king, then they can go ahead and try. Arthur explains that this was their best chance at destroying Linus, the largest opposing force at the moment. Ironside makes no excuses and simply prepares for his punishment. Arthur respects him a lot for that and doesn't hesitate to cause this guy an unimaginable amount of pain. Arthur then explains his goal. From the ancient past, mankind has always gotten caught in war with other species and suffered greatly because of that. King Arthur wanted to create a land with no pain, no sadness, and where no one is exposed to any kind of threat. That is why he built Camelot. He wishes to free the entire Britannia, but between the seven deadly sins and these new four nights of the apocalypse, his wish can't come true. 
Ironside has been getting tortured this entire conversation, and Arthur finishes it up by reminding Ironside not to fail him again. Arthur explains that no one in this world values him more than he does, and he releases Ironside from the endless pain. Ironside is shocked that the numbness he felt is gone, and Arthur points out that he removed the poison that Nason's put in his body. Ironside vows to search for Percival to get revenge, but Arthur has an even more important favor to ask of him. Arthur explains that they keep losing battles because their opponent has the vision, and he looks at Merlin for agreement. The only way they can learn of the future is to intercept it. Their opponent will be expecting them to try and take the vision. It won't be easy to get, so that isn't Arthur's request. Ironside is then shocked by his real request, and that is to search for his bride. Back in Sistana, Anne's father thanks our heroes for saving their town. The destroyed homes can be rebuilt, and what is most important is the fact that they didn't lose a single citizen. Sin tells everyone that his forest pals are probably eating breakfast somewhere, but everyone wishes he would just tell them who really came to the rescue. Anne's father then reveals that he knows Ironside because Ironside was an acquaintance of his wife. They were both holy knights serving under King Arthur, and his wife never had anything bad to say about Ironside. She described him as an upright man constantly striving to do good. No one can believe that since Ironside is clearly an evil guy these days. Anne's father has one more request to ask of them, but he is interrupted by Anne, who is starting to look more and more like Bulma from Dragon Ball Z. She is more serious than ever about becoming a holy knight, but fighting against Ironside has opened her eyes. She only now realizes how much she lacks in experience and power, so she wants to set off on an adventure. Anne wants to become someone that can protect what she cares about, even if she is alone. Her father refuses to let her travel alone, but our boy Percival steps up to ask her to come with them. This works for everyone, so Anne agrees to go with them. Her father tears up as Anne has so many similarities to her mother, but Anne points out that she has his eyebrows. She doesn't actually though, and the two have a heartfelt goodbye. As their journey begins, Sin reveals that he has no clue what Ironside is trying to do. One thing is certain though, and that is that Ironside will appear before them again one day. Sin must then tell the young hero to stop being so gloomy after realizing that his father wants to end him because he's one of the four knights of the apocalypse that is going to destroy the world. Sin states that he should be focusing that negative energy on becoming stronger, strong enough to send his father and fate flying. Percival is re-inspired and states that as long as he is together with everyone, he feels like he can become the strongest person to ever exist. The others are getting far ahead of him, so Percival rushes off to catch up to all his friends. Anne seems to think that she is the main character as she celebrates the beginning of her glorious quest to become a holy knight. Danny interrupts her little party to remind her that her father was supposed to give them transportation for saving the town. Donnie is pretty upset though as their transportation ended up being some derpy looking horse. Anne calls him rude since this derpy horse called Sylvan has actually been her best friend since childhood. Everyone begins to pity her since it must be hard to make friends when she has the ability to see whenever a person is lying. Percival always likes to keep things positive though and reminds her that they are all friends now. Percival tries to play a game to see if she can tell if he is lying, but after joking about the horse's short little legs, Percival gets kicked in the face. All the guys wish they would have gotten a wagon instead of just a horse, but Anne warns that she will leave them behind if they keep whining. Moments later, she is the one whining, as her horse friend is too exhausted to keep up with the boys. Sin sighs about the disappointing horse, but Sylvan confronts him to see if he has some kind of problem. The little fox is never one to sugarcoat things, and tells Sylvan that he will turn him into a horse kebab if he keeps slowing them down. While Sylvan shakes from fear, and asks about their destination. She becomes really excited after hearing that they are headed to the kingdom of Leonis because it's the homeland of the most renowned holy knights in all of Britannia. More importantly though, their ruler is King Meliodas, leader of the seven deadly sins. Percival shockingly doesn't know about them, so they wonder if he has been under a rock his entire life. Everyone explains that despite being branded as traitors to the kingdom, this group saved Leonis countless times. They are a group of holy knights who defeated the king of the demon clan in the holy war. Anne then shows her great treasure, a poster from Meliodas was a wanted man. Admiring this guy makes her realize that they haven't selected a leader for their group yet. Our boy Percival was never even taught what a leader is, so Anne explains that it's someone that unites the team. Percival is clearly the strongest among them, but she thinks he is more of a mascot. Nason's is more of a strategist, and she can only see Donnie being bait. 
He rightfully gets pretty upset, but Anne determines that she's really the only candidate for the leader position. Everyone just goes along with it, but Percival thinks Donnie should be the leader, since he was the one everyone thanked when leaving the town. Anne gets really upset, and questions if Donnie wants to become a holy knight as well, but he denies it. Sin calls everyone idiots and tells them that it's time to discuss their plan. To reach Leonis, they have to cross the Delfair mountain range, so they will first prepare at the nearest town. Anne insists that they just cross the mountains now, but Sin reveals that the place is a dark realm. Almost nobody makes it over the mountains alive. She concedes and Percival gets excited to be heading to a real big town. At some bar in the town of Kant, some guy gets really drunk and a worker threatens to kick him out. The boss fears this guy, however, and tells his men that they are fools if they don't fear him as well. That is because this man is Leonis' great holy knight named Hauser. Donnie then has a memory from when Hauser was training him and some other kid named Edlin on how to fight. Edlin was a better fighter than Donnie and Hauser always instructed them to never hold back. The young boys were ecstatic to hear that Hauser thought they were improving, but explained to them that it takes more than sword skills and magic to become a holy knight. It's all about how they use that power, but Hauser promised to teach him that too. The group finally arrive at the town of Kant, but it looks more like a weird fort. In town, Nasons goes to a forge to see if they can make things from glass, as he needs some medicine bottles. Anne goes shopping for clothes, and Donnie finds the tavern to have a drink. Percival hears cheers in the distance, and finds that it's a place where they are having some kind of sumo match. Sin is still at the entrance and yells at his team since they need to find a place to stay first. They eventually find a place, but Anne has all their money since she doesn't trust the men and beast with it. The boys all assume that she is on the toilet, but she has really just been shopping. Anne asks for some help from her subordinates, but Percival thinks she means she needs help wiping her butt. They all wonder what she was doing, and she reminds them that they need to be ready to cross the mountains. She reveals that she has bought supplies, but it's just a bunch of cute old stuff. Anne also bought everyone clothes, and is proud that she left them with three silver coins. Sin gets furious, however, as that is 20 silver coins short of being able to afford the inn. Not only that, but Sin gave her 10 gold coins, enough to furnish an entire house. Sin scolds her as a sorry excuse for a leader, as they will have to camp out for the night thanks to her. Everyone is pretty upset, but our boy Percival loves camping. Anne gets upset now and heads off to get their money back, taking Percival with her. The boys go to get a drink while Sin goes to take a walk. At the tavern, Donnie shoes away the guy mocking them for drinking ale in the middle of the day, but Donnie is shocked to find that it's Hauser. Hauser is drunk out of his mind and is disappointed that Donnie fled Holy Night training to become a traveling entertainer. He wonders if drinking is part of Donnie's act, but Donnie explains that he's just taking a little break. Donnie tells Nasons that Hauser is a Holy Knight, but is also his deceased mother's brother. Elsewhere, the shady worker from earlier tells his mystery boss that their target split into two groups. He explains that Hauser is talking to one now, but he will likely pass out soon. This mystery guy seems to have bad intentions as he tells his goon to show their target a good time. Elsewhere, the mini horse sympathizes with Sin for having to take their group all the way to Leonis. Sin is pretty stressed out as he explains that he never thought it would be so difficult. Back at the sumo match, the crowd roars as a new champion has emerged. The payout is huge and we see that Anne has won a whole bunch of money. All the spectators are stunned as Percival just beat all their most powerful competitors. Percival always displays great sportsmanship and thanks all his beat up opponents for playing with him. Back at the tavern, Donnie asks his uncle how his old friend Edlin is doing. Hauser refuses to answer as he doesn't speak to cowards that abandon their training. Nason's questions what a great holy knight like him is doing there, but he doesn't talk to amateurs either. Donnie accidentally drops the piece of the Coffin of Eternal Darkness and picks it up real casually. Hauser gets really heated about it and wonders where Donnie stole it from. Donnie denies stealing it, but Hauser distinctly remembers that Donnie used to steal coins from his wallet. Hauser wonders if Donnie even realizes what it is, but Donnie does kind of know how it's supposed to seal demons. Hauser gives him a good smack to the face and explains that if it falls into the wrong hands, Leonis will be wiped out. Hauser determines that he was a fool to ever think Donnie could be counted on. This guy really piles on and says that a kid as spineless as Donnie could never protect anything or anyone. Hauser is glad that Donnie gave up on becoming a holy knight and he is certain that Donnie's mother is crying up in heaven. Nason sticks up for him, but the other members of the group barge in. Donnie rushes out and Hauser takes all the money and won from betting. 
Hauser assumes that they are the ones influencing Donnie, but Nason steps in to demand that Hauser give everything back. Nason calls Hauser a drunk, and Percival wonders if this guy really hit Donnie. Percival gets really upset when Hauser admits to it, and all the drunk idiots at the bar get excited for a fight. Hauser refuses to fight a child, but Nason has another way to settle things. Our boy Nason is crazy, as he suggests a drinking game. They will drink one at a time, and the first person that falls loses. Hauser is already a bit drunk, but that makes things even considering that Nason is a child. The two begin, but Hauser states that no one has ever beat him at fighting or drinking. Nason continues the match, but whispers to Percival and Anne. He explains that there is something odd about the whole town. He thought it was nothing at first, but he's becoming more and more sure of it because of several clues. The shop Anne went to had items that were all priced the same, despite every item being completely different. The forge sold a bunch of things with the royal emblem. Those are added to special orders, not offered for regular sale. Nason determines that everything must be stolen, but that isn't all. He questions if all these people really live there. Just then, Anne and Percival both faint. Hauser compliments Nason for having a sharp mind, but unfortunately, he figured everything out too late. The mysterious guy from earlier arrives and tells Hauser that he picked the wrong place to take a vacation. Hauser is disappointed to see that the rumors were true and this person has become the leader of the bandits. Nason wonders who he is and Hauser gives the shocking answer. This person is Edlin, his apprentice and Donnie's old friend. These bandits have taken over the town and they attack any travelers that come through there. They have taken all of Hauser's weapons from his inn, but Hauser calls them all a pack of idiots. This guy is crazy as he has no fear and points out to them that taking the Great Holy Knight Hauser's weapons is not nearly enough to beat him. Nason is in awe of how Hauser hasn't even flinched at these guys and is more certain than ever that he is the Great Holy Knight of Leonis. The bandits seem terrified, but Edlin reveals that Hauser has already lost. Just then, Hauser shockingly collapses. Edlin is very familiar with how much Hauser is able to drink, as he has had to carry him out of bars many times. The bandits plan to sell them all as slaves, but Nason confidently declines that idea. He creates a mist that knocks everyone out, so Edlin realizes that he's using some type of magic. Nason just wants to get his friends and leave, but Edlin reveals that he has taken hold of Percival. This ends up just being a trick though, and Edlin knocks Nasons out. Elsewhere, Donnie beats himself up for running away from Hauser and is shocked to see Edlin. Edlin acts like a nice guy and reveals that he has cut ties with Hauser. Donnie is shocked to hear that Edlin has given up on his dream of becoming a holy knight, and Edlin asks him if he wants to team up for a well-paying job. Donnie points out that holy knights don't work solely for money, but Edlin reiterates that he couldn't care less about holy knights. Edlin explains that all Donnie has to do is pose as a local at the village and strip travelers of their money and belongings. Donnie thinks he is just joking, but Edlin is dead serious, and he reveals that he has a powerful ally on his side. Donnie rejects the offer, choosing to go find his friends instead, but Edlin reveals that he has taken all of Donnie's companions. Edlin points out that no one knows Donnie better than he does, but this guy made a serious mistake as Donnie becomes enraged. Donnie promises to make Edlin regret his entire life if he hurts his friends, and tells him that he has changed. Edlin uses a loud whistle to call his terrifying ally and explains that he didn't change at all, he just found his destiny. Elsewhere, Donnie's friends are tossed in a cell. The stupid bandits determine that the coffin piece is garbage and toss it right at Percival. The guards leave, but we see that someone else is there. Nason hopes that Donnie will figure out that they are missing, but Hauser points out that Donnie is too selfish and he will never come. Just then, the tavern keeper appears and begins to break them out. He is impressed that Nason is still standing after drinking so much, so Nason explains that his body can neutralize any poison he takes in. The guy breaks them out and reminds Hauser that he is his old friend named Tezu. Tezu tries to snap his old friend back to sobriety and explains that the entire town will soon be destroyed. Hauser assumes that it will be because of Edlin, but Tezu reveals that it's something worse. Outside, we see just how terrifying Edlin's ally is as it's an ancient dragon. Edlin somehow tamed this beast, so Donnie runs off as fast as he can. Percival and Anne eventually wake up, but Anne can't understand why Hauser is there with them. She concludes that he got her drunk to sell her off, or even worse, he planned to do something terrible himself. Hauser explains that he isn't into hideous girls like her, 
but Percival has had enough of Hauser insulting his friends. Percival plans to make him pay for hurting their feelings, but Hauser explains that he was just telling the truth. Percival shuts him up, but Nason stops him. Anne wants him to hit Hauser again for her, but Nason reveals that Hauser is Leonis' great holy knight. This great holy knight isn't feeling so well though, and pukes all over the place. Outside, Ellen tells his goons to capture Donnie, but instructs them not to hurt him. The bandits realize that they don't want to risk getting hurt, and decide to just kill Donnie anyway. Edlin orders the dragon to go back to its nest, but it hesitates. We then see just how evil Edlin is, as he threatens to hurt the dragon's unborn child. The dragon leaves and Edlin's men arrive to explain that they couldn't find Donnie. Edlin wonders if they are blind, and we see that Donnie hid himself. The creepy goons would rather have a taste of their prisoners anyway, but Edlin tells the weirdos to just keep looking for Donnie. The goons begrudgingly agree, but they seem to have other ideas. Tezu tells the others about how lost Edlin seemed when he first saw him. Edlin took over a group of bandits, and the bandits pointed out that Edlin rules them with fear. He is not only strong, but he also has guts. Edlin went into the dragon's nest all alone, and even stole an egg. The dragon has done Edlin's every bidding ever since, and Tezu assumes that it's because it's the last egg the old dragon will ever have. Nasons assumes that Hauser came there after hearing rumors about Edlin, but he tells Nasons that it's none of his business. Nasons realizes that something is off. The dragon egg could hatch at any moment and it would ruin Edlin's plan. Nasons is completely right, so Tezu reveals that the egg Edlin is carrying is fake. Hauser explains that Edlin uses replication magic. He is able to create a perfect fake in terms of look and feel. Nasons realizes that this must have been how Edlin tricked him at the tavern. Tezu reveals that their dragon seems to be catching on, and it's only a matter of time before it figures it out. Tezu wants Hauser to stop Edlin, but he thinks Edlin deserves what's coming to him. Tezu warns that the dragon isn't the only thing Edlin has to worry about, it's the bandits too. Edlin doesn't let them harm women or children, and he lets everyone go in the end. The bandits are fed up with him, and Edlin is just a lost kid. Outside, we see that the bandits have knocked Edlin out cold. He wakes up and finds that the idiot bandits plan to take over the world using the dragon egg. They refuse to give it back, but it doesn't really matter as the dragon appears behind them and the bandits toss the egg out of fear. It crashes down in front of Sin and the replica is destroyed. The enraged dragon goes on an absolute rampage and terrifies everyone. Donnie has no clue what is happening, but it becomes pretty clear that things are getting dangerous. Edlin desperately tries to get to safety, but the dragon finds him and unleashes its fire breath. Sin can sense Percival, so he wants to go to him, but he wonders why humans are always the one to cause trouble. Inside, Hauser stubbornly refuses to help, but everyone hears a strange noise. Tezu finds a terribly placed hidden door and finds a room holding the dragon's real child. They are surprised to see that it's already hatched, but it's clearly not doing well. Tezu explains that Ellen just didn't want to return it to the dragon in this condition, but Am points out that it's a typical bad guy that is actually a good guy scenario. Nasons determines that the dragon won't last more than three days in this condition and gives it some medicine. Sin arrives to reveal that he hasn't seen Donnie at all. Hauser calls Donnie a coward and assumes that he just abandoned all his friends. Percival sticks up for Donnie and tells Hauser to give Donnie the coffin piece when he comes back. Percival and Anne go to look for him, and Hauser has a memory from his past. It was the day Donnie quit training, and he was really down on himself for not having the kind of magic force Hauser has. Hauser tried to convince him to stay, but Donnie revealed that he really just doesn't want to die. That is how Donnie left, so Hauser is furious about it. Outside, the dragon keeps tearing things up. Edlin eventually falls and wonders if this is really how he's going to die. Just then, he is shocked as he begins to float and Donnie reveals that he is doing it. Edlin concludes that nothing he does ever works out. He failed as a hero and a villain. Donnie then shocks him when he reveals that he gave up on being an entertainer and has decided to start Holy Night training again. Edlin reminds him of his fear of death, but Donnie explains that he has found some friends that he's willing to risk his life for. We see that these friends of his feel the same way towards him as Percival finds Donnie. Donnie tells Edlin to trust him, and the two jump towards his friends. Just then, the dragon spots them and unleashes a devastating attack. 
Percival acknowledges that the dragon must be upset after having its egg taken, but we see that he used his unique power to protect everyone. Percival tells the dragon that he has things he wants to protect too, and sends the fire right back at the dragon. Percival's giant sends out a ton of fire that consumes the dragon entirely, but when the attack ends, the dragon is surprisingly unharmed. Another look into the past shows some more training, and it's clear that Edlin was always the better fighter. Hauser never wanted them to show mercy, and Donnie would always run for his life. He tried a sneak attack, but of course that failed like everything else he tried. Donnie would question if he was really cut out for training, and Edlin would agree that Donnie had no guts and always ran away. Donnie thought his friend was being too harsh, but Edlin always encouraged Donnie to keep trying. Back to the present, Percival is determined to stop the dragon, but this thing is ferocious. Tezu fears that the basement will cave in soon, and the baby dragon isn't doing so well. It's too weak to ingest medicine, so Nason's hopes that his healing mist will help. Sin tells the supposed great holy knight that he is a disgrace, and he doesn't have the right to call himself Donnie's teacher. Hauser is shocked to see that the little fox can talk, since he has only ever seen a talking pig before. Sin wonders if Hauser resents his students for betraying him, or if he actually resents himself for failing to raise them properly. Sin then shocks him when he reveals that Donnie saved the coffin piece from the Night of Chaos. Hauser can't believe that Donnie stood up against one of Arthur's holy knights, so Sin tells him the whole story about Donnie and his friends. Hauser thinks they are just a bunch of kids, but Sin explains that they are far more than that. Sin reveals that he found Percival because he was on a secret mission from the King of Leonis. Hauser is then really at a loss for words when Sin reveals that Percival is one of the four knights of the apocalypse. He explains that Percival is still inexperienced though, and we see just how true that is as the dragon smacks him. Something seems to change inside of Hauser, and he tells Nasons to remove the alcohol out of his body. Outside, Percival tells his friends to get out of there, but their horse can only carry one person. Percival tries attacking with his mini Percivals, but it doesn't work one tiny bit. The dragon lands a devastating blow on our hero, but luckily Edlin actually just made a copy of him. Sylvan does his best to carry everyone out of there, and Percival thinks about how cool dragons are. His grandpa used to tell him stories about them, and he is amazed to see that his attacks don't even scratch the ancient beast. Donnie wishes he would stop admiring it, and Percival calmly explains that he has no chance of beating it. The dumb horse trips, and it can't possibly go any further. The group has no choice but to run, but they are shocked when Hauser appears before them. A powerful wind flows around Hauser, and he takes his stolen weapon back. Edlin thinks that Hauser should just run like them, but Donnie knows that his uncle will be just fine. Hauser surprisingly walks right up to the dragon, and uses a wind attack to completely blow away the dragon's fire breath. Everyone is shocked by that, but they are even more amazed when Hauser knocks the dragon back with his powerful wind. Donnie tells his friends that they shouldn't be surprised, and reveals that this isn't even close to Hauser's full power. The dragon foolishly tries to attack again, but Hauser gains the high ground and uses his cyclone attack. This attack sends the dragon airborne, and Edlin wonders if Hauser was always this strong. Donnie reveals that he has been, he just never went all out in front of them. He explains that Hauser even fought and won against the demon clan 16 years ago. Hauser completely destroys the dragon, and everyone acknowledges that he really is a holy knight. Hauser is glad to see that his disciples are okay, and Donnie congratulates his uncle on his victory. Anne is amazed by what she just saw, and Percival can't believe how cool holy knights are. He is determined to become one too, and asks Hauser to let him join. Percival does his best impression of Hauser, and once again pleads for him to show him how to become a holy knight. Percival is determined to become stronger no matter what, but Hauser explains that there are better people suited for teaching him. Just then, Nasons arrives with the fully healed baby dragon. Hauser tells everyone not to worry, since he didn't finish the dragon off completely, and the dragon family is finally reunited. Anne fears that the dragon might attack the town again, but Hauser points out that it only went on a rampage because its child was taken away. Now that they are reunited, it will never attack again. Hauser promises to take care of everything from there, and everyone admires him. Hauser then stops Edlin from leaving, but Edlin thinks that there is no making up for what he has done. Edlin is ready to just be locked up, but Hauser tries to knock some sense into him. He points out that Edlin was just like Donnie, and gave up when he began to think 
he couldn't make it as a holy knight. Hauser shocks him though when he admits to being just as pathetic. A look back shows some more tough training and Edlin created a clone of himself. Hauser acknowledged that Edlin is able to make a perfect clone, but the problem is that he can't make it move. Hauser attacked him and told Edlin that his magic is not suited for combat. He told him to not rely on magic alone and to hone his skills. Edlin caved under the pressure and felt like he could never live up to Hauser's expectations. Back to the present, Hauser blames himself for not being able to get closer to Edlin, and he considers himself a failure as his master. Hauser saw how Edlin helped Donnie and his friends, so he thinks they should start training again. Edlin agrees and embraces his teacher. Hauser promises to atone for Edlin's sins and apologizes for hitting him. The impressionable Percival admires this guy a bunch and does his best impression of him again. Hauser apologizes to Donnie as well and Donnie explains where his fear of death came from. His mother told him that he needed to live for the both of them so he was never able to risk his life for people. Things have completely changed now though as he wants to become a holy knight who lives for his friends. Donnie explains that he won't be able to train with Edlin as he wants to continue on his journey, but they both agree to continue their dream of becoming holy knights. Hauser is glad to hear it and just hopes they accomplish their goal before he retires. Hauser explains that before he gives Donnie the coffin piece back, he needs to understand something important. As long as he holds on to it, Arthur's forces will pursue him to no end. The piece has the power to turn the tide of the whole war against them. Hauser is then shocked to see that Donnie has gone back to his old ways as he is hiding in terror. He doesn't want it anymore, so Percival decides to carry it instead. Hauser then does some smithing as he thinks that Percival needs a sword since he's supposed to be one of the four knights of the apocalypse. He attaches a blade to the coffin piece and Percival couldn't be happier. Hauser plans to help repair the town but wonders if Sin has reported back to the king about finding Percival. Sin was hoping to figure some things out first but determines that it would be best to let the king know just in case. Sin heads off on his own and surprisingly transforms into a human. He seems to be some kind of archer and prepares to fire an arrow. The others wonder where Sin went and are shocked when an arrow bursts out of nowhere. This arrow flies a super far distance and it is headed towards Leonis. In Leonis, some guards tell their majesty that the meeting for the day has been concluded. This mysterious guy invites the guards to eat a meal at his shop but they fearfully decline. Just then, Sin's arrow makes its approach in bursts, covering the area in light. The guards are stunned, and the mysterious young man recognizes it as a sign that the prophesied knight has been found. Back at the town, Percival says goodbye and continues on his journey with all his friends. One night, Sin tells the group to get some rest, as the next day will be very hectic. They are all too excited to sleep, so Percival suggests that they talk about awesome stuff like picking a name for his sword and finisher move. Unfortunately, his friends don't share his enthusiasm and decide to sleep after all. In the middle of the night, Sin senses that someone is calling him and he finds a mysterious woman. We can't hear the word Sin can and this person somehow knows Sin's name. Sin wakes up from this dream, but he is suspicious of this strange bride. The next morning, everyone climbs a mountain in the hopes of seeing Leonis from the top but they are shocked to see just more mountains. Sin reveals that it'll take four days to reach the Leonis side, so they have a lot more climbing to do. As they proceed, Percival gets real serious and tells everyone to go ahead, but it turns out that he just needs to pee. Donnie does too, but they spot something while using some trees as a urinal. It's a seemingly welcoming village, but Anne thinks it's a bit creepy. Sin can sense magic coming from the village, but the guys are eager to check it out. Just as they separate, a man appears to tell them that they can't go to the village since it's very dangerous. It's too late though as Percival and Donnie rush to it and pass through some sort of barrier. Sin rushes after them but the mysterious guy tells the others not to go as they will get stuck in there. He then reveals that it's not a village at all, it's a den of monsters. The boys finally reach the village as we see that there is definitely something wrong with these people. Donnie doesn't notice one bit though and thinks they're just really friendly. The boys introduce themselves and Donnie wonders if there is a bar he can go to. Some huge buff old wizard looking guy is the only one that seems to be able to speak and he reveals that there is no bar but they do brew ale. Back with the others we find that the hunter's name is Ard and his dog is Carrie. Ard patrols the area so that travelers don't go into that so called village. Ten years ago the village practically popped out of nowhere but he has no clue where the villagers came from. 
Nasons thinks they look pretty normal, but Art reveals that he saw something himself. The moment those people leave the village, they turn back into monsters, and any traveler who goes in there is never seen again. Our group rushes to tell the others, but Art stops them as it's too dangerous. They have already made up their mind to help their friends, so they ask Art to tell them everything he knows. Back in the village, Donnie tries to get hammered, but the drink has a strange tang to it. The old man still tells him not to worry though, and explains it was modeled after Britannia's ale. Percival's just as innocent as always, and explains that seeing so many people smiling makes him want to smile back. It's pretty strange that they aren't talking, but the old buff dude explains that they just don't speak the language. Percival doesn't believe they need language as long as they understand each other's hearts, and Donnie is amazed by this kid's profound words. As the boys chatted up, old man Gandalf takes a suspicious look at Percival's sword. Just then, Sin arrives and reveals to the old man that he knows he was spying on them using a bird he saw earlier. Sin demands to know what he is after, but the boys tell him to relax since everyone there is so nice. The old man seems to recognize Sin, so he wants to speak with him alone. The boys are left to feast on a weird tasting meal and they can't stop themselves from eating a bunch. They haven't eaten a proper meal in a while, so they wonder where the others are. The boys just can't get enough, so they ask for more food and drinks. One of the villagers goes to get the stuff, but we find that the big dude working the kitchen is a real weirdo. The thing he has captured gets wrecked, and we are left to wonder what the boys are eating. Back at Gandalf's house, he compliments Sin for figuring out who he is, but we see that Sin is out cold. Outside the village, Art points out that there is a circle of stones around the village. The villagers never leave that circle, because if they do, they turn into monsters. The big giant guy is the elder, and he scolds anyone that tries to leave. Ard reveals that they will have to destroy some weird stone in the center of the village that is referred to as their idol. The villagers are always taking care of it, so he assumes that it must be important. The plan is to destroy it and rescue their friends during the confusion. Ard offers to create a distraction while they sneak in, but Nathan is concerned that Ard will be in danger. They wonder why he is so eager to help them, and he reveals he has a daughter. Her name was Connie, and when she was young, their village was attacked by monsters. This is why he accepted the job to patrol the area, and he plans to see his daughter again when the job is done. Anne uses her human lie detecting abilities to determine that he hasn't lied a single time, so they decide to trust him. They approach the village, but Art can't enter the same way they can, since the villagers are on the lookout for him. Our group enters, but the barrier repels Art for some reason, and he wishes them luck. With that part of the plan in action, Art gets to work creating a distraction. It works, so Anne and Nasons move forward, but Anne can't help but complain about how much trouble the other guys get them into. Percival is the real troublemaker though, and it's like he doesn't have a cautious bone in his body. Anne thinks holy knights need to be able to make cold calculated decisions under any circumstance, but Nason points out that she needs to be focusing on their mission. Anne agrees and reveals that she will use this opportunity to show everyone that she is worthy of being leader. Just then, they hear Donnie screaming as he is in a great deal of pain. Nasons instantly takes on the leadership role to tell Anne to get to the idol while he takes care of Donnie. Donnie's head is the source of all the pain and Nasons is shocked to find that they are surrounded. Anne then spots Percival taking a beating but she knows that she can't dive into the fight. She will just get caught like the others so she must hurry to the idol above all else. Anne finally reaches it and thinks about how if Art is right, the moment she destroys the idol, the village will fall into chaos. She ties Sylvan to the idol, and the two begin pulling. This thing is incredibly heavy, but she vows to save everyone. Back with Percival, he is determined to not give up, but it's pretty clear that these strange people are very strong. Percival's friends arrive soon after, and Donnie explains that Nason's helped him feel better. It turned out that while the ale was delicious, it wasn't good for his body. Nason's wonders what Percival is doing, and he reveals that he was just teaching everyone some sumo. Percival's really starting to get along with these guys, but the language they speak is completely unfamiliar to the other guys. Percival though just casually speaks this monster's language that sounds like it's coming straight out of a demon, and his friends are stunned. Percival's new friend explains that it is the language of the demons, but Percival can't even explain how he knows it. Back with Anne, she is really struggling to pull the idol. She determines that she will never be able to become a holy knight if she can't even do this, so she gives it another go. Sylvan gets motivated too, and the thing finally starts to move. Back with the old dude, the villagers tell him that they have taken a liking to Percival. Just then, he senses something and wonders if their device is malfunctioning. 
It's actually Anne, and she says what Percival likes to say, which is crush the evil and rescue the weak. This proves to be the last push as the idol comes crashing down and the rocks around the village explode. Something happens to the villagers as well, and Percival is shocked to see that his new sumo buddy is now a demon. In fact, all the villagers are demons, and Ard thanks the kids for breaking down the annoying barrier. Ard then shockingly removes his disguise to reveal that he is some kind of knight, and his dog is actually a bigger dog. He declares that it's time to let the hammer of blood fall upon the demons, and return Britannia to the human race. Anne runs from all the repulsive monsters, and is shocked to find Percival being carried by one of them. She demands that it free her friends, but Percival reveals that it's actually his friend named Dolcemonte. The group has never seen a village like this before, but what is still most surprising is how casually Percival is able to speak the demon language. They wonder what the entire point of this episode was, because destroying the idol only broke the spell that made them look human. However, Gandalf arrives and explains that that isn't all it did. Destroying the idol also allowed the enemy to intrude upon them. Nasons tries to explain to the Elder that they aren't enemies, but the Elder wasn't talking about them. Just then, our group hears Ard's voice, but they are shocked to see that it's coming from a mysterious person. Ard reveals that he is a holy knight in King Arthur's service, and his real name is Ardbeg. He has waited for this moment for a long time, and declares that he will finally eliminate the demon clan. Thanks for watching my recap, sign up to my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel, link is in the description.